Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining our talk in tax reform. This topic, uh, the topic of the day will be excise taxes. We have an excellent panel for you guys. We have Norman Bierenbaum, who is director of cannabis programs at, in the state of New York and president of the Cannabis Regulators Association. We have Richard Oxier, who is senior policy associate at the Tax Policy Center. And we have Todd Nesbitt, who is assistant professor of economics at Ball State University. Now, I encourage you all to submit questions, which you can do at the bottom of your screen through the Q&A function. I just wanted to introduce today's topic a little bit, excise taxation, excise tax trends, why is it interesting? Um, but let me start at the beginning. What is an excise tax? Uh, when should it be levied? Um, and how should it be levied? So if we use the IRS definition, an excise tax is a consumption tax which is imposed on the sale of specific goods or services or on certain uses. That means it's narrow by design, right? It's traditionally been levied on widely consumed goods like alcohol, motor fuel, and tobacco. It used to be quite an important source of revenue, especially for the federal government. If we go back to the 1930s, it would make up half of, or almost half of total tax collections. Today, much less important, only a few percent of total collections come from excise taxes. Now, it's our position at the Tax Foundation that excise taxes should generally only be levied to internalize a negative externality or to establish a user fee system. Now, what does that mean? Um, negative externalities or internalizing negative externalities, sometimes when you do that, it's called Pigouvian taxes, named after British economist Pigou. Um, it's a tax on a market trans transaction that creates a negative externality or some additional cost, right? A negative externality harm, societal cost, a negative consequence of consumption of economic tra transaction. Examples could be pollution, um, secondhand smoking, and other things like that, where the consumer or the polluter doesn't carry the cost, um, but society carries the cost. And you can use excise taxes to correct that. When we talk about a user fee system, you can think about the gas tax. So using gas purchases as a proxy for your use of the road system um, it's a good way to sort of approximate uh, approximate your use and um, and cover the cost that way. Now, excise taxes are often in tension with themselves, right? So in the U.S., we often levy them to raise revenue and often to maximize revenue, but they're also levied to lower consumption, and you obviously can't do both at the same time. Now, how do you go about designing an excise tax? So the first thing you should do is decide on a tax base, right? You wanna do the tax base that is the best proxy for the negative externality or the cost associated with consumption. For gas or for, for road use, gasoline is an example. For tobacco smoking, amount of cigarettes is a good example for a tax base. The two standard designs are quantity-based, specific, or price-based um, ad valorem. Next question is the rate. How high should, rate, should the rate be? So it's difficult to do in practice, but you should aim to have a tax rate that corresponds to the cost associated with consumption. So you don't wanna have a rate that's higher or lower um, than the cost associated with consumption. You can sort of think about it like how an insurance premium is an approximation um, of your risk associated with whatever you're insuring. You should levy the tax as early as possible to limit the number of taxpayers. So Excise taxes at the federal level are often levied at manufacturer level to have few taxpayers. And at the state level, it's often levied at wholesale level to have fewer taxpayers. Importantly, revenue that is raised um, from excise taxes, either as a user fee or as a negative externality internalizer, should be used to offset the cost. So when we raise taxes on gasoline, from gasoline, we should spend that money on the roads. When we raise money from tax on sports betting, we should use that revenue to offset um, negative externalities or harm associated with problem gambling. Now, excise taxes are consumption taxes. Consumption taxes often result in higher effective tax rates for lower income Americans. Now, that's not necessarily a, a reason to not levy them at all, but it is a good reminder that we shouldn't rely on them for general fund revenue because the, the, the real brunt of excise taxes are felt by those who make the least. This is especially true for tobacco because tobacco consumption increases as income decreases. Um, 
So effective rates paid by smokers are much higher for the lowest income quintile than for the highest income quintile. Um, again, not a reason not to levy them at all, but a reason to consider the levels and our reliance on them. Now, today we're going to talk about specifically um, tobacco vapor products, recreational cannabis, and sports betting. I just want to introduce the topics a little bit. Vapor products has been a trend in taxation for uh, at least five years. Um, a lot of states have introduced taxes on these products as the nicotine market in America has changed. Right? It used to be cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco. Today, we also have vapor products. They're generally thought to be less harmful than cigarettes and taxes should correspond to the harm, right? So you wanna tax vapor products at a lower rate than combustible uh, tobacco products. Some states have done this with a tax per milliliter. So they'll tax your e-liquid that is used in the vapor products per milliliter. But some states have just shoehorned vapor products into existing tobacco categories um, and tax them at really high uh, rates. Examples could be Minnesota, where the tax is 95% of wholesale value, or DC, where the tax is, I think the latest tax is 91% uh, of uh, wholesale value. Staying with tobacco taxes, and an another example of why narrow-based taxation is sometimes risky in terms of relying on, um, relying on them for revenue if they're not widely consumed, so tobacco, if we go back to the 50s and 60s, probably half of Americans smoked. Today we're in the teens. And you then have unrelated policy um, that will impact your revenue generation. So one example is flavor bans. Last June, Massachusetts was the first state to introduce a flavor ban on cigarettes and uh, chewing tobacco, a statewide flavor ban that is. That means you cannot sell menthol cigarettes, you cannot sell wintergreen chewing tobacco. And if we look at the effects of that in terms of tax revenue, they're quite stark. So in Massachusetts, menthol cigarettes made up about a third of the tobacco market. Um, and a year in, so that would be June to May, we have results um, in terms of sales and tobacco tax revenue. So in Massachusetts, the decline in sales was 24%. So almost the entirety of um, the sales associated with flavored cigarettes disappeared. And on its face, that looks like a great success. Um, in reality, if it was the reality that 24% fewer cigarettes had been smoked, I assume most states would implement this right away or the federal government would implement this right away. But the truth is that Massachusetts has neighbors and these neighbors have not banned uh, flavored cigarettes. So in New Hampshire, which is the neighbor to the North, sales increased by 22%. And in Rhode Island, neighbor to the South, sales increased by 18%. So this little experiment has cost Massachusetts $115 million in the first year in tax revenue, while New Hampshire has gained 40 million and Rhode Island has gained 22 million. So the reality is not much uh, in terms of public health has been achieved. They've just moved tax revenue to their neighbors. Recreational cannabis is a big challenge um, from an excise tax perspective. It's probably one of the hottest trends um, that we've seen over the last year. We are up to 19 states, I think it is, that have legalized recreational cannabis, all of them introducing some shape of an excise tax. The majority doing a sort of sales tax, additional sales tax, a price-based tax, uh, which is probably related to the complexity of the cannabis market. There are hundreds of different types of products, um, all with different externalities. So it can be difficult to come up with a good proxy for harm. Um, so the ballot, the ballot driven legalizations have all, um, almost all included a sales tax like excise tax. Um, but we're starting to see states implement excise taxes that do a much better job of, uh, of using good proxies for harm. That's the reason we're so happy to have Norm here today who will talk about New York, which is one of the states that have implemented an excise tax system that actually tries to um, approximate the harm associated with cannabis use. And I'm sure he will dive into that in a little bit more detail soon. 
In terms of revenue, um, this is one of the things that we often hear, how much revenue can a state raise if they legalize cannabis? Now there's some revenue to be gained, but it really is, um, it is not revolutionary for a state's revenue generation. Colorado, which is one of the most successful states in terms of creating a marketplace for recreational cannabis, raises around 1% of their total tax revenue from cannabis. Now that's meaningful, but it's not revolutionary. Um, and states shouldn't rely on recreational cannabis to really plug budget holes or do other things. The, uh, the revenue should be spent on running the system, sort of a closed loop. There'll be cost associated with getting this up and running. There'll be cost associated with um, the negative externalities associated with cannabis consumption. And, and that's where the revenue should go. The final topic of today is sports betting. Another big trend, more than half the states have legalized since the Supreme Court decided that the federal ban was not constitutional. Sports betting is one of the examples of excise taxes where a price-based tax is actually very appropriate. Um, the amount of wagering that a consumer does is a good proxy for harm. Um, so ever low is good. Normally the states will do a, an excise tax on adjusted gross gaming revenue which means the revenue after winnings have been paid out um, to bettors who guessed correctly. A few states do allow some deductions. Um, I recently published a, uh, a blog post on this, which is, is kind of strange from, it, from an excise tax perspective. Um, but the important point in terms of sports betting is that just like with recreational cannabis, sport betting operators are competing against illicit operators. So lawmakers need to be careful about total tax burden when they establish these systems. Um, it's important that the product that is being offered through licensed operators is competitive with what illicit operators can offer. And finally, I'm gonna round up my little portion here talking about what is the future for excise taxation. Um, I think we'll see more excise tax categories pop up and emerge. Um, some of the old ones are not disappearing, but not as important as they used to be. Um, tobacco, probably the best example. So many more smokers um, in, the, in the past than we expect in the future. We're starting to see some examples just yesterday about measure in California that would implement a tax on single use plastics was approved. So that'll be on the ballot next year. That, that's one cent per single use plastic um, and I think the estimate was that several billion dollars may be raised through this levy. So that's quite interesting to follow. We've seen examples of spring water extraction taxes. We have ride hailing taxes, um, short-term rental taxes. So I expect we'll see more, more excise tax categories pop up. Now I just wanna reiterate that all consumption does include some kind of negative externalities and we shouldn't try and correct all of it through excise taxation. Um, there's simply too many negative externalities to account for. Um, and yeah, uh, let me repeat that you can post any of your questions at the bottom of your screen through the Q&A function. Um, and then let me turn it over to Norm who will talk to us about recreational cannabis. Thank you, Ehrlich. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to represent the state of New York and the cannabis regulators uh, association, we've seen a ton of innovation and changes in the cannabis space over a relatively short period of time, going from you know, prohibition to all out uh, regulation and legalization in many jurisdictions. And one of the things that we've seen a tremendous amount of movement on is tax mechanisms and how they're employed and why they're employed. Um, so we're starting to see now, as you noted, uh, a shift from just straight ad valorem or even straight weight base excise taxes uh, on the biomass now more towards taxes that are based on either the product form or the cannabinoid content of, uh, of cannabis, uh, typically matched with an ad valorem tax as well. Uh, what we did here in New York was that very thing. Um, we have a cannabis concentration tax uh, so it is either 0.5 cents, 0.8 cents, or 3 cents per milligram of THC that's in the cannabis product, depending on the product type. And that is to factor in the pharmacokinetic impact of smoking a, uh, a joint as opposed to 
uh, eating an edible and the impact that that has on the person. You may characterize it as harm. Other people would characterize it as relief. But one way or another, there is a difference in the uh, psychoactivity um, that that the consumer feels in understanding that THC content is right now driving the market. We felt that that was a more uh, nuanced way and granular way to get to what other jurisdictions are trying to accomplish through weight-based taxes. Because of the variation in the cannabis plant, um, you can have vastly different THC content in flour as opposed to trim, or within flour itself, you could have certain flour that tests at 25 to 30% THC or 10 or 15% THC. So one of the things we saw here in New York when we were doing our research is jurisdictions like Colorado, like Nevada that had certain weight-based uh, or, or market value-based tax associations with the product were creating all these subcategories. It wasn't as simple as one rate for flour, one rate for trim. Uh, in Nevada, they have you know over half a dozen different subcategories of flour based off of the market value, which is ultimately based off of the THC content. So we said, let's get through the middleman. Let's not get in the business of regulating the harvesting, the drying, the curing of the biomass because we have opportunity for nefarious activity just within that business practice. When you harvest the plant initially, uh, you're going to expect about 80% weight loss uh, through the drying and curing process. So that's a lot of opportunity for people to either bring product in or have product leave the regulated market um, in their tracking and tracing. And so it can be administratively burdensome for the for the state to, to keep their finger on the pulse there. Um, we, we rely heavily on our seed to sale tracking systems, but there is human error and some of that's by accident and some of that is actually um, more by design. And so our preference was to place this more on the testing laboratories. At that point, the product is already fully cured. It is in its final form. It has its final amount of THC that's in it. And so by going uh, off of the final uh, label of the product and the amount of THC in that product to establish our, our first excise tax, uh, we thought that that was a far better uh, mechanism from a simplicity standpoint and also from an administrative standpoint. It also asks some questions, you know, how reliable is product testing within the cannabis space? And the answer is not very, uh, you know, cannabis testing and analytical laboratory testing has been one of the uh, hardest things for regulators to really uh, keep an eye on. Um, there's a lot of gamesmanship there, but we have some other things that we plan on doing around our quality assurance and our laboratory oversight and using the state lab as a reference lab to help keep that in line. Um, another thing to note about our cannabis concentration tax is it is paid by our wholesalers here in the state, our distributors. And that is uh, in an effort to limit the number of participants and licensees that we're actually collecting taxes from and that are remitting that to the state. Uh, banking is an issue here in this industry. And here in New York State, we do not take cash when it comes to tax collection. So understanding that the distribution tier will be somewhat consolidated, typically that are financed and capitalized and have access to depository banking and electronic payment processing systems. There was a, a benefit for us to also put that on the, uh, on the label as it's reflected with the amount of THC as opposed to on every single cultivator in the state who may not have as uh, stable access to depository banking. Uh, finally, we have our ad valorem part of the tax structure. Uh, and this is a combination of a 9% um, tax that is collected by the state on the final uh, sale value, and then also 4% that's added on, which goes to municipalities or, or the locality in which the product is sold. Um, and that is in an effort to make sure that we're fully capturing the true market value of the product, because there are going to be other manufacturing processes along the way, and other things that contribute to the price. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, while excise taxes may originally been used to uh, quantify and, and nullify externalities and harm, um, particularly in the cannabis space, the local taxes that we're seeing and virtually every single state has a local tax rate is actually used as an incentive for localities to allow these businesses to take root. Um, you know, we're not seeing these necessarily be earmarked for public health and safety programs. Um, many municipalities and localities do use the funds uh, for those 
those efforts and those programs and initiatives, but they can use it for whatever they want. And if they do not opt into the program and they prohibit licensees, they are typically not allowed to have access to that revenue, um, even though they may be seeing the exact same externalities from cannabis use, uh, but their citizens are just getting it from the neighboring town or the neighboring city. So that, that's an interesting thing that we haven't really seen movement on. But um, you know, we were the first state um, in my opinion, to use a cannabis concentration tax. Uh, Illinois does have a somewhat similar mechanism, although theirs is more based off of product category than straight concentration. And theirs are uh, very discrete and static uh, tax brackets based off of potency levels, as opposed to taxing the actual amount of THC that's in the product. Um, but now we're seeing Connecticut come online with a very similar mechanism that we have, which is good for regional symmetry and avoiding any type of race to the bottom, um, because really no good comes from that. Um, uh, a few other things to note is, you know, this is such an innovative space. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with, with what has been happening with Delta 8 THC uh, over the last six to eight months, but this is a brand new version of THC, which also impairs users, which can be derived from CBD produced from hemp, and it's being sold in rival markets to the adult use um, uh, industry and regulatory structures right now. So in New York, we included other isomers of THC into the tax base as well. So we are taxing based off of the total concentration of either Delta 8, Delta 9, or Delta 10, but there are potentially unlimited isomers of THC. And we will have to go back and you know rewrite our law once there's a Delta 11, a Delta 12. And this gets back early to your point of what are you taxing here? We do not have uniform mechanisms of administration uh, of these products like what you see with cigarettes or or cigars. Um, and so we really have to be nimble in our in our uh, and our tax approaches. Um, you know, another thing to note, and Ulrich, you, you spoke uh, about the uses of tax revenue. You know, states are increasingly devo uh, devoting revenue towards externalities from cannabis use, but it's being seen in a new light. And that is actually the externalities of cannabis prohibition. Um, we're seeing more and more states now say the harm from cannabis either being regulated or lack of regulation or the use was not from using this substance or this plant, but it was from the enforcement um, and the disproportionate enforcement from law enforcement and the targeting of communities that are typically communities of color. And so you have um, now dedicated funding from tax revenue that goes to community reinvestment in communities that have seen disproportionate impact in Illinois, in Connecticut, in New York, where we are taking 40% of all of our tax revenue and dedicating it to uh, community reinvestment in these different communities of disproportionate impact. Um, and we are now seeing a trend in various states where if you do not have this type of mechanism and reinvestment, um, you're really not passing many laws. Um, so that's another notable change on the tax end. We do have 20% of our tax revenue, which is going directly to prevention and education, um, making sure that we are you know, tackling and devoting resources to the public health and safety externalities that come not from prohibition, but from continued use of the plant. Um, but how that gets used is, um, is yet to be seen in terms of the different programs that we're putting in place. You know, states are largely at a disadvantage because our public education, our public monitoring, our public health and safety campaigns and initiatives around cannabis do not receive supplements from the federal government for the most part. Anyone who's deploying a public awareness campaign around tobacco, opioids, nicotine are typically using a campaign that's been developed, evaluated, and is part of a national registry uh, that the feds facilitate. And we do not see that on cannabis. So there's a question of, are enough state resources going to addressing these potential harms or externalities? And that's one of the reasons why we have a variable tax rate for our uh, cannabis products to make sure that those products that are impacting and potentially impairing folks more are the, are the products that provide more of a tax base and, and um, more revenue for the state. Um, you know, some, some other considerations and something to keep in mind is this narrative that we have around taxation with the cannabis um, sector, particularly around its, its cause and effect uh, when it comes to either absorbing or transitioning the legacy market. We have a very robust legacy market, illicit market, um, gray market, whatever term you're using for it here in New York. 
um, and everywhere in the country. It's one of the reasons why prohibition has failed um, here for cannabis and also previously failed for, for alcohol. Um, and so the, the excuse me, um, so, so one of the things that we're hearing is high tax rates are going to result in high product rates, which is not going to be competitive with the existing market. Um, and that certainly is true um, in terms of the, the relationship between tax and, and the ultimate price. But when we're standing up new markets, the price is extraordinarily inflated because of a lack of supply and a lack of distribution. And so you see these arguments where you should have an escalating tax rate that increases over time so that you can be as competitive as possible in your early years. But those early years are the years where the price is highest because of this lack of competition and meeting demand. And so one of the things that is being discussed around the, the regulators table is, you know, is this actually an effective tax approach or is this something that's just providing more profits and margin to the early operators um, in the nascent stages of this industry because we're not, we're not having an impact on, on prices at all. And looking at what was just um, put forth with the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act um, from Senators Schumer, Wyden, and Booker, you, know, you have this escalating tax rate. Um, but the interesting thing there is it would be placed upon more mature markets already in Colorado, Washington, and in, in California, and elsewhere. So it may actually have some of the effects that industry are talking about in terms of a gradual increase in helping to be competitive with the existing legacy markets. Um, Probably not so much for brand new markets that are being stood up, but for those existing established markets, it may actually have that intended um, consequence. So um, I'll, I'll pause here. I'll let other folks uh, take it away. But um, that's a little bit of what we're doing here in New York, why we're doing it, some policy considerations around um, state tax rates. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate it. Um, and now Andre Richard, who will talk about sports betting. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going. Thank you so much to the Tax Foundation for having this event and a special thank you to uh, Ulrich and Tyler for inviting me to be here. And I was invited to talk about sports betting. And so with my 10 minutes, I want to go over three things. I want to do just a quick like, you know, what is sports betting and, you know, what do policymakers need to know about this? Uh, then with like the little time I have left, I'm going to talk about how sports betting fits into like the broader picture of state sanctioned gambling. And also talk about, you know, this is a bet on excise taxes, but like, does the sports betting and gambling more generally really fit with these other two topics we're talking about today? But first, sports betting, what is it? Okay, simply it's a wager on a sporting event. Um, if you have filled out your office's March Madness pool, you bet on sports. If you've done that silly squares game during the Super Bowl, you bet on sports. Um, but what we're really talking about here are wagers placed at a sports book. And a sports book is that room in a casino with all the TVs turned to sports or increasingly on your phone. Um, these sports books will take all kinds of bets. You don't just bet on the winner of the game. You bet on the total points scored. You bet on the individual players. You bet on the halves, the quarters. Um, there are all sorts of things you can place bets on. Okay, what does any of this have to do with the tax foundation and public policy? Ah, okay, for decades, the only place you could legally place a sports bet was Nevada. This was by choice. States did not want to allow you to bet on sports. But in the 90s, states started increasing other forms of gambling and Congress got nervous that sports betting was next. So they passed a law that said, states, you can't approve sports betting. Uh, this law was challenged and the Supreme Court overturned it in 2018. To grossly oversimplify what the court said, they said, look, Congress, if you want to ban sports betting, have at it, but you can't tell states that they can't do it. So as soon as the 2018 uh, ban was taken down, you immediately saw states like New Jersey, Rhode Island, Delaware, West Virginia, jump in and approve legal sports betting. Now, I think we're up to something like 30 states in the District of Columbia that have legal sports betting. So this is a very prominent issue in state capitals across the country. So, okay, policymakers, what do you need to know about it? For this presentation, I want you to learn three terms. Okay, the first one is the handle. The handle is what is bet on sports, either at a particular sports book 
or in an entire state. So for example, in 2018, the handle in Nevada across the state was $5 billion. $5 billion was wagered on sports. All right, but funny thing about betting, sometimes people win their bets. And so the sports books don't collect $5 billion. They collect the losing bets after paying out the winners. And this is revenue, sports book revenue. So in 2018 in Nevada, sports book revenue was 300 million. And that final term is the hold. The hold is the percentage of what the book collects on all the wagers. So in 2018, 300 million divided by 5 billion is like five to 6%. And that's typical. Typically sports books collect, the hold is five to 6% of all the wagers they took, okay? Now, what's important is that revenue number. That's what we care about as policymakers because that's what states tax. And that's actually you know what countries tax globally when they tax sports betting is the revenue. So that 300 million is what you apply Nevada's 6.75% uh, rate to, and that gets you to $20 million. So we went from 5 billion wagered to 300 million collected to 20 million collected by the state or 0.4% of all the wager ended up in the state coffers. And that's important because when I read a lot of stories about sports betting, people love to throw around the handle. They'll talk about how Americans wager $150 billion, and that's true. And I bet in your state, billions will be wagered on sports. But remember, billions wagered turns into hundreds of billions collected, turns into tens of millions, actually for the state. Um, another thing to know, Nevada's rate is 6.75%. Most sporting tax rates are about 10%. There are some outliers that I don't really want to discuss, like Delaware and Rhode Island that do this like revenue sharing thing where the casino gets X, the sports book gets Y, the state gets Z. Those can get really high, even close to 50%. But for most states, taxes on sports betting are around 10%. And that's important because these taxes have to be low because sports betting is a low margin business. Remember, revenue, the thing that's taxed, that's what the book collects after paying out winners but before it pays its expenses, its staff, its advertising, all the stuff that keeps a sports book in operation and keeps it popular. Sports books are never going to collect a lot of money. In fact, some successful sports books lose money just because the betting didn't go their way. Most casinos have sports books not to make money, but to lure in gamblers who will then play other games and lose their money in other ways. So when you're designing tax rates, you know, you hear a lot about competition from illegal markets, but if your rate is too high, you're simply not going to allow the sports book to operate. And so that's why most of these rates are clustered around 10%. Um, okay, but so say you're a state, you decided to legalize sports betting, and you want to just maximize as much revenue as possible. Okay, I got one way for you to do that and one way for you to not do that. The one way to do that, again, is your phone. Okay, most sports betting is now done on phones, just like everything else in the world. Uh, New Jersey, New Jersey is probably, I think it's the leader in sports betting revenue now. It's, it's where the most action is for a host of reasons. Um, and they got a bunch of casinos in New Jersey where you could hypothetically go to place a sports bet. But in the first year of New Jersey sports betting, before the pandemic, something like 90% of its revenue came from online gambling. If your state wants to make tax revenue, from sports betting, you have to allow online gambling. Okay, so what's the way not to do this? Well, you could do what we did here in the District of Columbia, where they decided to create their own sports betting app. Um, I have used this app to play sports wagers only for academic purposes, of course, so I can give presentations like this. And the app is terrible. In fact, something that I didn't appreciate when I first learned about this is that sports betting is one of these things where like, there are sports betting losers like me who will bet a few times, but like your real gamblers bet a lot and they care a lot about the odds and they care a lot about the interface. They want to use private operators. So allow private operators that the betters know and trust to come into your state and operate, keep your taxes low, allow online betting, and that's going to be your best way to raise tax revenue. Okay, now putting this more into like a broader perspective of gambling. I remember when like sports betting, the ban gets overturned and a lot of reporters asked me like, 
oh, will so-and-so state allow sports betting? Will these states allow sports betting? And the answer was yes, of course. Why? Because your state already allows a lot of gambling. 45 states have lotteries. 25 states have casinos, and that's not even counting the ones with tribal casinos. Um, so why would sports betting be any different? In fact, the only real opposition to sports betting in a lot of states are these like states that have agreements with tribal casinos. And so they're having to navigate that. But otherwise, if your state allows betting, which it probably does, because only three states don't allow it, and those are Utah, Alaska, and Hawaii, that's going to allow sports betting. And all this gambling does generate real revenue. Um, in 2019, gambling-related activities brought in like $33 billion for state and local governments. And like that's like 1% of state and local revenue. Like, as Ulrich said, not budget changing, but that's real money. Um, but keep in mind, two-thirds of that was lotteries. Lotteries are how states make money. Casinos were like another 30%, and then the rest is like these horrible video games and horse racing and sports betting. But even if sports betting is adopted by like all the states and it's up and running, it could maybe bring in a billion dollars. One, that's not 1%. That's not gonna be even close to 0.1%. Um, your state may bring in millions of dollars. In fact, it will, because that's how sports betting works. Remember like billions to hundreds of millions and the state collects millions that can help fund public programs that are important and money you otherwise wouldn't have. But anytime a policymaker or a politician says a word like boom uh, or a revenue boom, I cringe a little bit because it's never, ever going to happen. And if you read the state revenue reports produced by governments, they'll tell you the two things you need to know about sports betting revenue is that it's small and that it's volatile. OK, finally, like with my last minute or so, I just want to talk about gambling more generally. And I kind of like want to sing that song. One of these things is not like the other. Um, because like Ulrich talked about like kind of the reasons you have these like excise taxes, but specifically sin taxes, is you either, you know, you want to discourage the person from using it, right? Like Todd is going to talk about cigarettes and he has takes on cigarettes and like whether we should be discouraging it at certain levels. Um, but like it's clearly the taxes to discourage you from smoking. States want you to gamble. I took a trip to New York recently and I had DC government tell me to gamble. I saw Maryland's government tell me to gamble, Pennsylvania's government told me to gamble, and then New York's government told me to gamble. And I think this is something to really think about because you know, you will often hear politicians say that we are expanding gambling, whether it's sports betting or anything else, because it's a way to get revenue without taxing your constituents. That's not true. The way you get money from gambling is people lose bets. Your constituents lose at gambling and then you take a part of that money in. And so when you're thinking about gambling and you're thinking about how you use it, because a very small fraction of this money goes to anything like with having to do with gambling problems, it's mostly used for general fund and education purposes, realize that this is you're actually getting this money from people, from your residents, from your constituents. And so that's why you want to think critically, you know, not so much about maybe the tax rate, the tax rate has to do with the business, but like how much you're promoting it and depending on this revenue. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Um, and on to Todd to talk about tobacco. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Richard, thank you for the, 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 uh, the plug there to get started. All right, so um, Tyler, if you want to go ahead and start the uh, uh, PowerPoint, that'd be great. All right, so, and you can just skip to the second slide. Uh, all right, so uh, ultimately, just uh, back one. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to jump in, and most of the presentation is going to be uh, focused more so on uh, cigarette taxation. Uh, I will make some comments on on uh, vape uh, taxation as well. Um, so here we're just looking at uh, the average tax rate there in blue on uh, uh, state tax rates on cigarettes. This is uh, in real dollars. Right? So clearly it's been going up. Uh, you see in response to the uh, likely to the 2001 recession, states were looking for new sources of, of uh, revenue uh, during that crash. And so um, a lot of sin taxes went up during that time period, including uh, the excise tax on cigarettes. Uh, it's kind of leveled back out to, to the same growth rate that we saw uh, in the early 90s as well. Right. The one other thing that I think is interesting here is that the standard deviation, the spread of uh, a measure of the spread of, of taxes uh, on cigarettes across the states that's also going up. Um, and so there's a lot more opportunities uh, for consumers to therefore um, take advantage of taxes being uh, lower in the next state over or uh, more organized criminal activity 
where they can uh, uh, instead um, uh, buy in bulk, say from Virginia, and then illegally transport cigarettes across state lines and resell them in, illegally in other markets, uh, other states. This is certainly going on. Uh, we, we've seen several uh, uh, cases of that with that, that's uh, um, criminal syndicates being busted, doing that exact thing, buying in bulk in Virginia and attempting to resell uh, in New York City. All right, so um, now we can go to the next slide, please. So just seeing some of that variation, you see, uh, this is not accounting for any local taxes. New York and, and Connecticut have the highest cigarette taxes uh, at the state level. Notice DC is even higher than that. Uh, so if we uh, uh, include DC. DC is the highest uh, taxing, um, I guess, district in, in a way, if you don't account for the New York City tax, uh, which is another $1.50. Uh, so notice in New York City, if you were to buy a pack of cigarettes there, you're paying the $1.01 uh, federal tax, the $4.35, uh, state tax, another $1.50 um, uh, local tax, and you're already up to there, uh, what, six eighty six. dollars um, That's only beat by Chicago, where the collective taxes across federal, state, county, and city is $7.17 per pack. Uh, here in Indiana, not that I smoke, uh, but I could buy a pack of cigarettes and pay for all the taxes for far less than just the taxes that people are paying in Chicago. Uh, there are a ton of people that live in the region, uh, that live in Northwest uh, Indiana, who are the, you know, just jumping on the train and uh, carting them back and forth, either for friends or uh, for themselves, if they live in Chicago, going to Indiana, buying and then going back. Uh, so a lot of this, uh, we, we will say this is smuggling, right? Uh, some of it's legal, right? So it's just cross-border shopping. Um, but typically, most states allow for only one carton I'm sorry, two cartons per person in a vehicle, um, in, a, in a private vehicle, to be carted across state lines in a legal manner at a time. If you cart more than that, now you're you're getting into uh, some illegal activity at that point. There's also a dollar amount uh, in total value um, over the course of a year. All right, so uh, so we see a lot of variation in cigarette taxation across the states. Uh, what about vaping? Uh, just real quick. Uh, there are, the last that I counted, uh, 27 states that tax uh, uh, vape, um, and some of these are ad valorem, on, like, so a percentage of the wholesale price. Some of them are uh, based on, uh, it's a per unit tax, so based on milliliters um, uh, within the cartridge. Um, uh, some of those actually do vary based on whether it's an open or a closed uh, system. Closed systems tend to have uh, higher taxes largely because they have higher nicotine uh, content as well. Um, and then other states will have some variation where they also tax just a flat amount per cartridge um, and regardless of the, the milliliter. All right, so a lot of variation there. Likely this is leading to a lot of confusion for, for a lot of consumers trying to figure out where the higher taxes are. Um, however, um, notice uh, for instance, state of Indiana does not tax uh, currently vapor. Um, we're surrounded on, on the west, south, and on the east by states who do tax it. Uh, folks that live near our border uh, in those states of Illinois, Ohio, and Kentucky very likely are coming into the state to avoid some of their own home state taxes. Uh, and so uh, sales here uh, in Indiana vapor likely are higher as a result of those taxes across state lines. And so, so we do certainly see uh, uh, in a lot of these situations you'll see some of this cross-border shopping. And again, in some cases it will, especially as, as we've seen, and as I'll discuss here uh, in the rest of the presentation, uh, large-scale uh, smuggling, where it, it is truly tax evasion, not just tax avoidance, um, activities that really resemble things that you saw in prohibition. So one of the, the terms that we've, we've coined here is prohibition by price. Uh, Ulrich talked at the very beginning of, of this session about what is the appropriate level of the tax. Well, if you get the tax too high, uh, you now are going to start encouraging more and more people to turn to the illicit sector, uh, the underground economy, uh, in order to avoid taxation. And now you're in a, a bit of a slippery slope uh, once you, you encourage, you have encouraged people to go to the underground economy in that regard. All right, so, uh, so, uh, so again, we see with excessive uh, excise taxation, you do see a lot of activities that end up resembling what we would observe during that prohibition era. And right, so if we can go to the next slide, please. 
All right, so um, so there with cigarette taxes, you can just see some of the uh, uh, the very vari variation there. Um, so uh, again, New York clearly there them and uh, Connecticut having the highest state taxes. Uh, but even in that uh, northwest, or sorry, the northeast, uh, there's a high taxes generally in the northeast, high taxes on the west coast. Uh, the tobacco uh, states, you know, say Tennessee. Uh, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, uh, all of those tend to have some of the lower taxes. Uh, if you look at the border between Michigan and Indiana, it's roughly, Michigan has a tax that's roughly uh, uh, twice that of Indiana. Uh, so keep that in mind when you see the next uh, slide here. Uh, the, the picture is uh, a picture of, of a uh, sign in Michigan, uh, southbound uh, on Route uh, 39, uh, going into Indiana. So Tyler, if you can hit uh, next for me. And so this, this is a sign advertising for a smoke shop in Indiana, um, but it's advertising, hey, no Michigan tax. Uh, it's telling consumers, look, you can avoid the Michigan tax by just shopping just across the border, go an extra mile uh, and get your smokes there, right? So um, this is you know, trying to avoid some of these taxes. This is small scale typically. Uh, this is pretty common, right? Uh, and clearly, some, uh, some shops are, are advertising uh, that factor. All right, so this is ultimately what we're trying to pick up. Uh, I run a, a model, an empirical model uh, with work uh, with the, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy uh, in coordination with the Tax Foundation. And so that model, I'm just not gonna go into the, the, the uh, entry details. Tyler, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, but I do wanna give you some idea of what we're doing. It's basically um, for collecting a bunch of data across the states, we have two different stages and trying to measure uh, by how much uh, of consumption is actually due to uh, cross-border shopping uh, and also what we call diversion, right? So this, this uh, large-scale smuggling, right? So some of the merits of the model, it, this is a really a, an intuitive, simple model. Uh, there are other academics out there that have, that have, uh, uh, have much more complex models. And honestly, we're all giving uh, results that are in the same ballpark at the state, right? Um, and so uh, some of our outer sample projections have reasonably, reasonably reflected some of the actual changes in legal sales across states. So New Jersey, when they uh, increased their tax rate, I think in, uh, don't quote me on the, on the year, I think 2016, um, it, uh, uh, our model projected really close to what their actual change in sales was. Uh, so with higher taxes, they had lower sales as people uh, shopped across state lines, especially in that Northeast. It's every, you know, a lot of small states there. Cross-border shopping is pretty easy there. All right, so some of the limitations, these are some of the things that I think are important for us to understand um, when uh, considering any, any taxes, right? So uh, what are some of the sources for where this, the, the uh, uh, illicit material, illicit product could actually come from? And a lot of it within cigarettes um, is actually through the ports. There's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of cigarettes coming in illegally through the port system, and then traveling through bonded warehouses. Bonded warehouses really good to help facilitate uh, uh, international trade. They're basically like a, a free trade zone to just stage the product. Maybe there's a shipment that comes into uh, Los Angeles. Some of that, a lot of the product is supposed to stay here in the United States. Some of it's going to go to Canada or Mexico, uh, and so rather than uh, sending multiple ships to every one of those different countries. You end up just sending one to say Los Angeles and then have trucks carry uh, the product uh, uh, to the uh, other, other contiguous countries. And what we're seeing is that with the bonded warehouses, talking to some of the, the officials is uh, ultimately, there's a lot of diversion that's happening in the bonded warehouse. It's basically a gaping hole for cigarette smuggling. Uh, the product just uh, disappears uh, along that track. Uh, in, in various ways, right? Uh, there's also uh, uh, tax compacts with uh, some of the, the uh, uh, native uh, tribes, uh, the, some of the, the, where you see tribal sales. Uh, Washington, State of Washington has actually done this. Uh, their argument is typically that, okay, well, it's, it's closing some of this gap uh, in, in cigarette smuggling, uh, some of the, the casual uh, cross-border shopping in a way, if you consider the tribe as a cross-border. Um, and so the tribe is now for, they're now collecting taxes on, the, on behalf of the state for sales to non-tribe members. Uh, ultimately, I would argue that that's really just creating another intermediary 
where you have tribe members buy uh, cigarettes and then sell themselves illegally to um, non-tribe members. Uh, so it's just creating another intermediary there in, in a lot of that process. All right, so, um, all right, so, uh, so rather than get into some of the intricate details, let's just jump into some of our results, just give you some idea. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. All right, so here I just, uh, I estimate, just worry about the kind of in the middle there, the uh, uh, total avoidance and evasion. Uh, so here we're estimating, again, these are not abnormal compared to a lot of other state, a lot of other studies. Uh, the state of New York, as a percentage of total consumption of cigarettes in the state of New York, uh, we estimate just over half of all those cigarettes consumed are actually from uh, illicit, or really originated from outside the state. Uh, whether it's just simple cross-border shopping or the um, more probably uh, more organized crime uh, syndicates uh, where you see um, diversion over long, longer scale, say from Virginia up to, to New York. All right, so uh, the top five in terms of cons you know, this tax avoidance and evasion as, as a percentage of consumption, New York, California, Washington, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, on the other end, you end up seeing that a lot of these cigarettes are, as a percentage of consumption, New Hampshire, this is where the cigarettes are originating from. Not necessarily that they have low taxes. Notice that New Hampshire doesn't really have a, a low tax. It's roughly about the average of, of the entire nation, but relative to other states up there in the Northeast, they are one of the lower uh, taxing uh, districts. They also uh, have a pretty low um, uh, smoking prevalence there anyway. So as a percentage of consumption, that's, that uh, probably overflates really how much uh, smuggling there may be coming out of New Hampshire. Again, not a whole lot of smoking compared to a lot of other states uh, in New York or New Hampshire. All right, so uh, what about some of the states where during the 2018, 2019 year, uh, or so in 2019 where you saw taxes change. So Oklahoma, Kentucky, and Maryland all increased their taxes during the 2019 year. Um, and so I wanted to show uh, what happened to uh, those particular states, we end up seeing that uh, all of them ended up, if you look at the rank, they are trending toward, uh, other than, than Maryland here, I guess Maryland didn't didn't change their tax rates, sorry, they actually moved down. Uh, a lot of that is, I would argue, is due to other states uh, in, in, the, uh, increasing their tax rates in previous years that we're now picking up in uh, 2019. But certainly in Oklahoma and Kentucky, you see them uh, Oklahoma went from a rank of 30 down to 17. So again, smuggling um, uh, being less of a, of, a, of a source state than they were before uh, and more uh, going to 15% of their consumption now being from smuggled sources on net. Uh, Kentucky, uh, there it's only uh, basically it's a wash at that point compared to where they were before, much more of a source state. Um, right, what's this mean for revenues? So if we go to the next slide, we can actually see uh, what what all of this means for, for overall revenue. Again, just showing the, the two endpoints. So California and New York are both losing, uh, based on our estimates, about a, a billion dollars of tax revenue. Because if they could somehow capture all of the smuggled sources, you know, all, all these additional, uh, this additional consumption that's originating from outside the state, um, there, they could uh, potentially increase their, their tax revenue by a billion dollars. You see Texas, Minnesota, Washington also up there, not nearly in the same ballpark as a million dollars. Other states certainly are gaining the, from this in terms of being source states. New Hampshire gains an extra uh, $78 million of tax revenue because it is a source state, right? Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Here we can see that there's been some, some changes in some of these rankings. Uh, Maryland uh, is, uh, uh, is basically because of some of the, the changes that have happened there, uh, they're moving down in the rank. Um, and you see that uh, Oklahoma, Kentucky, um, you know, here they, they are moving uh, basically up. So going from losing more revenue than they were before as a result of increasing their taxes. Um, and so closer to number one is you're losing more and more revenue. In that case. And so, um, so that's really, a, you know, it's really, I wanted to give you some idea that, look, you, you can ultimately encourage the, these illicit markets through excessively high taxes, especially when you see uh, nearby states, and in some cases, not even all that, that nearby state have much lower taxes. Uh, as a result, you end up seeing this, this prohibition by price. Uh, effect. All right, so that's all I have. 
Um, and with any of the remaining time, uh, I'll turn it back over to Art to, for some Q&A here. Thank you all. Um, we don't have as much time as we had hoped for Q&A. Uh, so I think we'll do one question uh, and then for the questions we don't get to, feel free to email me or Tyler and we'll get an answer to you afterwards. Um, but let's see here. We'll do a, there's a cannabis question here. Um, maybe Norm has an answer for. Is any of the money coming in from cannabis excise taxes being used for research to understand the health consequences? It was one of the topics I touched on that we don't have great understanding of the impact of consumption. Um, so maybe that's an important answer or a question to answer. Yeah, so so the answer is um, yes, kind of eventually. And by that, I mean, typically states will take some amount of revenue to put towards public health and safety uh, data surveillance and monitoring, um, public health surveys, going through hospitalization data, poison control data, arrest records, um, you know, insurance codes. The problem is that the underlying data is not very telling. The old ICBD hospitalization codes really meant that it was up to the practitioner who was filling out your chart, whether they you know, decided that you came in and you had a broken leg and someone ran a red light and hit you. And you said that you are someone who uses cannabis in the past. Well, that might be a cannabis related uh, admit at that point. And so now we have better codes um, to really show is this associated with cannabis use. Um, but the other problem is that these resources are typically not made available until after collections have started which means the industry has been stood up, which means already there are sales. Um, and then you can go and start to collect your data. At that point, you've lost your baseline completely. Um, and if you are a state that's neighboring, a state that's legal, then you know it doesn't even matter when you get resources two years down the road to put into monitoring and surveillance um, because you've already been impacted by the neighboring state or the fact that you're legal and you don't have the revenues coming in has already started to change trends in consumer behavior and use. So what we're doing in New York is luckily we have built this into our implementation costs to upgrade all of our public health monitoring and surveillance and initial education campaigns as well. But it's a very comprehensive effort because every single public health system we have, whether it's a survey or some type of data collection, really is completely you know, really inadequate when it comes to cannabis, because we rely on federal systems. And the only questions we have answered from, you know, NIH and CDC are basically, you know, what was your first age of initiation? And, you know, how often do you use is it on a, you know, monthly basis, or, or maybe daily or near daily, it's not looking at how do you use mode of ingestion, potency, uh, your access or um, to to marketing and advertising, whether you're getting it from the legal market or the illicit market, and all these things that we wish we had. So um, that's why it's yes, kind of eventually, but we're really not doing uh, enough of a good job with it. Um, but there are some things in the works at the state and federal level. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, it's 1 p.m. Uh, as I said, Please email me with any other questions. I'm sure our panelists will, will help me get an answer to you um, if you have a burning question. And I want to thank you all today for participating and for people listening in through the hour um, and come back for our next talk and tax reform um, when we have our next one. Thank you so much.